above consecutive is an absolutely fascinating aspect of the Hebrew verbal system. Um, and in this video, I want to talk a little bit less uh, concretely about the specific dynamics of how it's made and whatnot, and talk more about the cultural and theological uh, significance of it. I've mentioned this in a couple of different places in the textbook. Um, it's introduced a little bit conceptually in chapter 6, uh, and also theologically and culturally, and I'll be drawing on some of those reflections in this video. And then uh, in chapter 10, it's introduced more formally in terms of how, how the form is actually constructed. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll review that as a way of getting into the theological conversation. So above consecutive is a modified version of the imperfect. You'll recall that an imperfect form is made by taking the three letter root and attaching a contracted independent personal pronoun onto the beginning of those that three letter root. And by attaching the pronoun to the beginning, the indication is that action is about to begin or has already begun and is now ongoing. Often, uh, most often, uh, imperfect forms are translated into English as uh, present tense or more commonly future tense verbs. And it's very important to remember that the Bob consecutive is created by attaching uh, a Bob to an imperfect form. Now there's a scholarly debate about this that I, I want to uh, name. Um, and some people uh, would disagree with what I'm about to say and what I've already said. Um, and that's the nature of scholarship, that not everybody agrees. And that's helpful because um, differing opinions is, uh, prevents uh, easy consensus. Um, and uh, so uh, I just want to be upfront with you that not everyone will agree with what I'm saying in this video. Um, but I'm compelled by it, and I, uh, I'm convinced by it, and that's why I'm teaching it to you. Um, so, again, you take an imperfect verb, three-letter root, with a pronoun attached to the beginning, that's often translated as future tense or present tense. The way the vav consecutive is formed is you take that form and you add three things to it. Most importantly, you add a vav. Underneath the vav is a patach, that's the, the vowel, it's an a vowel, it's just the straight line across the bottom. A vav followed by a patach, and then there's a dagesh forte in the prefix, which is uh, the name for, the grammatical name for the pronoun that gets attached to the three letter root at the beginning of the word. It's called a prefix, right? A fixed, the four, uh, prefix. So uh, you attach this vav to the imperfect form, and then what happens is fascinating. The vav reverses the, uh, in English, it reverses the tense of the verb. And so we translate vav consecutive forms as past tense verbs. Now, Vav consecutives, as you read in the chapter, are almost only used in the context of narration. Either, and most commonly, a third person narrator who's telling a story, describing the events as they happen. That's where the name comes from. The Vav part of the name comes from the fact that the, the form is dependent on the addition of a Vav to an imperfect form. And the consecutive part of the name comes from the fact that, or the function of the verb, uh, because it functions to narrate consecutive actions within a story, uh, an, an unfolding plot. And so the narrator will basically say, and this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And that's the way that the Vav consecutive functions to keep the story moving. I'm convinced 
that something much more profound, something much more nuanced and complex is happening, uh, something with cultural and theological significance, not just a grammatical anomaly or a gr grammatic, something interesting grammatically. So uh, let, let me try and articulate what I think is happening here, or, or one idea uh, about what this verb form might indicate that the people of Israel believed was happening. As I understand it, it has to do with sacred time. It has to do with how the people of Israel imagined God, God's character, uh, how God was present in the world, in their lives, and what the relationship between uh, heaven and, and history was. Um, and uh, so the, the people of Israel uh, understood that, <coughs> that time functioned on two different planes of reality. One plane was uh, uh, what the Greeks later called chronos. And we have that word in the English language as chronology or chronological time. This is the, the sort of tick-tock of the clock. This is just the simple progression of time that it was the morning earlier today and now it's the afternoon that it rained yesterday and it's not raining today, that I ate food an hour ago and I'm not eating anymore, that I once was young and now I'm older. It's just the natural progression of time uh, that, uh, that moves uh, consistently forward on and on throughout, the time, throughout life. But there's another kind of and that kind of time, in, in Greek, the word that they used to describe this was kairos, time. Uh, and in Hebrew, the word would be more moed. Uh, moed is the word for appointed time, uh, sacred time, festival time, uh, the time of encounter. Uh, it, it, it's the time that, that uh, marks heaven and earth overlapping. And, uh, and in this kind of time, this, this is sacred time. And this is the time that is suffused with God's presence. This is Sabbath time. Um, and, uh, and I think the Vav consecutive is used to describe, uh, uh, or, or is used often in the context of this sort of experience of time. And so uh, the, the people of Israel would have uh, told their stories. They would not have read their stories. They would have told their stories. And they chose to use this, this verb form, or this verb form emerged out of their experience and their assumptions about life and reality. Uh, and what it points to is this idea, well, well here's, here's a question. Uh, you can maybe imagine in your own mind uh, and heart, what you think it points to. Why would the people of Israel have told stories from their past using a verb form that's incomplete, that's imperfect, a verb form that describes action that is ongoing or about to begin? Why would they narrate stories that haven't you know, that have been over and done with for hundreds of years, perhaps. Stories about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, stories about uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, stories about Yael, and Deborah, and Joseph, and Moses, and Aaron, and Miriam, stories, right, Esther, the stories of the, the, their beloved ancestors stories that they held deep in their hearts, and stories that were themselves a direct connection with the presence, the promises, and the blessings of their creator God, the living God. 
in whose presence they would uh, be ushered into through the telling of these stories. So why would they tell these stories clearly from the past? In a chronological sense, these stories have been over and done for a long time. But they told them using an imperfect verb form. Why do you think they may have done that? Perhaps pause the video and think about it for a minute if you want. Um, my sense is that they told the stories this way because they felt like when they told the story, the story wasn't over and done. That the story happened again in the telling, that God acted again, that the blessing of God was released again, that, that the ancestors walked and talked again through the, the telling of the story. Uh, that um, it, it wasn't just a crusty old story from the past. It was a story that was alive, that, that flowed through the, the veins, that pumped through the heart of the people of Israel. And when the story was told, its power was reactualized in their midst. Uh, and so, um, so this verb form allows them to tell the story in such a way. To, to acknowledge that the past isn't over and done, but the past actually breaks into the present in order to create a new future. The stories for the people of Israel were like sacraments for us in the Christian church, that something that happened 2,000 years ago on a cross, the power of that moment breaks into the people of God gathered around the table every time we break the bread and share the cup of communion. The power of God's uh, descent on uh, Jesus like a dove, the power of Jesus' resurrection, death and resurrection into which we are baptized, the power of Naaman's healing in the Jordan, the power of the people of Israel passing through the waters of the Red Sea and later the Jordan. All of these stories are, are, are actualized. The power of them breaks in again every time we, we dunk uh, someone in a pool or lift out the water and pour it on a baby's uh, forehead, hands, and feet, perhaps, if that's uh, your church's practice. These stories were sacramental to the people of Israel because they, they, uh, they released the power of God. They released the, the presence. They, they, they were like a doorway through which the people of Israel could enter more fully into God's presence than they could under the normal circumstances of their lives. Time and these stories... Um, gave the people of Israel a, a different kind of access to the presence of God and because they believed, like we believe, that God is present and is revealed through the word. That when we speak the word of God, like John Calvin said, these words breathe something divine, that God is in them, that God indwells the word, and we have a different kind of access. God is revealed. God is present. You can see I'm searching for ways of describing this. God is present. Uh, the, the Bible is like a doorway that we, we enter into, enter through into God's presence. And uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that. But one really important and critical one uh, to me is, uh, is the grammar. The vow of consecutive form, it, it, it helps me understand how uh, this, this cultural and theological uh, reality or worldview or system worked. And um, I, I find it just deeply fascinating. And, and I hope that you do too. Uh, hopefully this was helpful and, and encouraging and, and thought-provoking for you. If you want to continue the conversation, um, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to, to interact with you. Thanks. Shalom.